this and you know he's right. gonna make you money okay great we'll buy it right versus you know exactly. uh, what well, problem let, let's get into those howls and let's you know, get that sick Financial Innovations Podcast, uh, where we're helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting-edge technology. Really excited today to have John Santi with me. John, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me today. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited to uh, to bring John on just, you know, because we've had a bunch of episodes where we've talked through, you know, the finance side of, you know, investing in technology what things to look into, you know, how to effectively interact with IT. And, you know, it's, it's great to have something with uh, where, you know, we have an IT perspective on, uh, on the same topics over there. So, you know, maybe John, if you want to just give a minute to, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, you know, then we can jump right in. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for having me on today. So I've uh, been in IT my entire career. Uh, I actually started off on a help desk. So I was the guy out there, you know, changing out keyboards and monitors and fixing computers and all of that fun stuff. Made my way through various infrastructure, project management roles. And then too many years ago, decided to cross over to the other side of the desk where I have been leading teams across a variety of different industry verticals. But in all of those, you know, really been focused on How does IT support the business? How does infrastructure support the business? And making sure that IT is an enabler for what the business needs to do as opposed to a hindrance or a roadblock. Right. And and it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, because I mean, I also come from I started out at the help desk, too. So we uh, we kind of share that uh, share that part. Um, But, you know, uh, it's funny because. We talk to, you know, a bunch of CFOs, VPs of finance, you know, people in, in a variety of roles. And, you know, what what I'm seeing is, you know, the companies that seem to be most successful are the ones who are able to effectively partner with IT versus, you know, in, in some organizations, there's a little bit of a clash, if you will, where, you know, IT is kind of seen as the the naysayer, the the people that, you know, are the, you know, hey, you can't do this, you can't do that here all these rules and regulations that we're putting in, in effect to, you know, to, to seemingly slow things down. Right. And, um, you know, we, we see a bunch of different dynamics over there. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, if, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, what are, what are some of the ways that, you know, the business can be more effective in, you know, partnering with it versus, you know, kind of seeing it as a, it's us versus it. No, definitely. So, you know, one of the things, and I've joked about this in the past, is uh, you can never give IT enough money. Like, we we will spend every dollar that you could possibly conceivably give to us, and not necessarily in a bad way, but it is something that just based on the nature of what we do and the type of personalities that come into IT, we love pushing things forward, having those newest, latest, greatest technologies where the breakdown happens, and I have to own a lot of that uh, from my side of this and my chair, is the language of business and the language of IT tend to be very different. It's very much the case of speaking separate languages, and the people who are in the chairs between those two groups have to have a common understanding of how each other work and what that language is without having that understanding in place of well, I just heard all of this techno babble and I just heard all of this accounting jargon. There's got to be that intersection of it where both people are understanding that at the end of the day, both sides are wanting the business to move forward. They're wanting the business to be successful. But how do those different talking points, how do those different terms and what not to get thrown out actually mean that same thing? That's probably the biggest roadblock is just the language and the terminology and the realization that both sides are pointed in the same direction. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because, you know, if you kind of approach it as this is going to be a battle, I think you're already on the losing side of it, right? And and, and it's not going to turn out to be something, you know, very constructive and very, you know, moving forward for the business, right? Versus if you're looking at it like, hey, this is a partnership, you know, we're both, uh, we both want the same thing. We want our, you know, our company to grow over here, you know, how do we work together? And, 
you know, and, and sometimes it can even just be, you know, to your point of different groups speaking different languages, it could be a matter of let's bring somebody in that speaks both languages in order to ensure that, you know, hey, my requirements to you are being, you know, effectively communicated and, um, you know, and we're not like asking for something that, you know, seems ridiculous, like, you know, hey, I want to, you know, beam this off of satellites or whatever. And, you know, and you're over there, like, why do you need that? Yeah. And IT leaders have really got to own that, uh, you know, because I mean, every industry has jargon, but across every industry, you've got a common underpinning of technology needs. So as an IT leader, we've really got to own being able to translate all the gadgets and gizmos and jargon into something that is much more palatable to the business. And, you know, I've certainly been working on that. Lots of leaders in this space are working on that. And I think we're making moves in the right direction, but there's definitely still a gap there. You know, I've also seen too, just, you know, kind of bringing IT in earlier to certain initiatives. You know, I see all, all too often, right, uh, somebody, you know, a vendor goes to a, a finance person, right, because they, you know, they're controlling the money over there and saying, hey, you need dashboards in your organization, buy my BI tool, right, you know, or whatever insert, you know, uh, name of the day and, and, and all that into it. And they say, all right, you know, buy this business as, oh, well, I was told I needed this and this is the latest buzz. And, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, why we need dashboards. So I'm going to go to IT and say, we need dashboards. Uh, here's the technology that we want to buy now, you know, go and figure out what we need to, to do this versus, you know, how do we effectively ensure that, you know, we're implementing and supporting a product that is the right fit for our organization. You've really hit the nail on that one. The earlier you bring IT in for a need or a project or an objective, the better it's going to go. If you want to see an IT person pull out their hair, let them know that they're going to be implementing something after it's already been purchased. And none of the security requirements, none of the integration requirements, none of the access requirements, none of the capacity requirement, none of that's been done. You just bring us in and say, hey, we bought this, go make it happen. That fuels a huge fire between the business and the IT department. And again, I see a lot of organizations are starting to get better about that, but there's still much too wide of a gap in where IT is brought in versus where they really need to be a part of that conversation. Right. And and also understanding that, you know, finance or, you know, whatever the department is that's buying the technology, they're just one piece of the organization. You're, you know, kind of across the entire organization. I also see far too often, you know, people just listening to vendors and, you know, somebody goes and, uh, you know, Microsoft came and said, you need Power BI. And so they go and buy an enterprise license to Power BI Meanwhile, the group, you know, across the hall has an enterprise license to Tableau. And, and, and now, you know, you're you've bought the same thing you're having, you know, but different products uh, you're having requiring support for both products. And, you know, there's a lot of money being wasted and, you know, man hours being wasted, getting trained on, you know, conflicting technologies over there where, you know, having that conversation and saying, all right, let's really just plan this out. And come up with, you know, an organized way to going and doing this that, you know, could save a lot of headaches. Yeah, there's an entire industry that has sprung up around being able to detect duplicate and overuse of software within organizations to see, oh, look, you have Zoom and Teams and Google and and you know, why don't you guys pick one and save the money and then apply that to another area. Uh, I work with a lot of really good vendors that are in that space that help do exactly that because, When you start looking at all of the assets that IT has to track, people are like, oh, well, it's a computer. How do you not know where that is? Well, it's a computer and all the pieces that go with it and all the software that's in it and all the licensing that goes. Those are all assets that end up being tracked and are very tangible costs to the business. And you have to be taken into account if they're not properly analyzed. You're just putting money out the door constantly. Yeah, no, that that's that's a great point. Uh, would definitely love your perspective on, you know, kind of with the move to the cloud, right? I, I feel like it's it's been great in many ways and it's been it's complicated things in other ways. Whereas, you know, back in the past, you know, you used to kind of be locked in with one particular type of vendor. Like, you know, I bought an Oracle ERP system, so I'm just going to go and buy all the Oracle products that, that are out there because I saved some money. You know, now you kind of are moving to this like best of breed um, type of approach of, you know, maybe I want, 
Salesforce for my CRM and Oracle for my ERP and, you know, this for BI and that for, you know, and um, you start mixing and matching. And, you know, while it's been great in some ways that, you know, you could pick the best product for you, you know, not kind of having that constraint of, you know, focusing on one vendor, you know, just kind of floods uh, all the channels of, you know, vendors coming in and saying, oh, hey, you know, I have a cloud product uh, it requires no infrastructure, go and, you know, buy it. And, and you, you start getting flooded with all of the, you know, LinkedIn messages and, and, you know, cold emails and calls of people just trying to get you, you right, know. It, just, it's, it braids the shadow IT environment because it is so easy for an individual. You know, you've got somebody with three direct reports. They've got this shiny new tool. IT says, hey, we have to go through it. We have to review it. And we have to do all these things. And like, oh, whatever, put in their credit card number. And five minutes later, they're using the product. So it, that helps has helped breed some of the adversarial relationship because you, you kind of go back to this idea of the cloud and the SaaS applications, and it all dials back to good, fast, cheap. And the, a lot of these cloud applications, these SaaS applications, have now made it good and fast without conceptualizing that, okay, well, now you're giving up some of the cheap that goes around that because it is so easy to overspend. It's so easy to bring in huge amounts of these tools uh, where we're seeing a lot of change in that now, especially kind of behind the scenes on the, the infrastructure and the data side, is we're starting to see some of that getting pulled back in-house, where we're seeing IT departments either having uh, private equipment in a public data center or they're having their own on-premise equipment again, because it is proving to be more cost-effective than just putting everything in the cloud. And I think we're going to see kind of this next generation of that be a real cost optimization. I don't know a single person sitting in my chair that doesn't ask about that every time there's a new cloud product or SaaS product brought in is how are we going to ensure that we're optimizing the spend on this, which I think should be music to the finance world's ears, that that has become something that we are considering at the front of all of this work now. Right. Because, you know, it, it's so hard to really quantify, well, how much is this costing you, right? You've got... Um, now, I mean, even you see data center spend, you go and spin something up on Azure, AWS, it's all right, well, it's this price per gigabyte that you have on here. And then it's a separate price per core and a separate price per RAM. And then you're paying for bandwidth in and out. And, you know, and, and before you know it, a, a seemingly, you know, 10 cents an hour uh, type of application spins into, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month that are just being spent. Uh, exactly. On You've got users that if things aren't configured properly can spin up, you know, $100,000 a month instances like that. And it's typically not caught if you don't have all the right uh, guardrails and all the right alerts and reporting in place until that first invoice hits. And somebody's like, wait, wait, what, what is this? What, who did that? And, and it was just $10 dollars a user, right? <laughs> <laughs> times 10,000 users, times right. the, the, the bandwidth costs, plus right. all you do extra storage. So here you go. Yeah. Right. The, the fine print matters, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a great point. And, you know, it's um, it, it, it's harder in many ways to quantify the, like, what are things actually costing? I think it you know also opens the door to, you know, now that you can kind of pay a la carte for everything you need, you can ask the question of, do I really need this versus, you know, in the past, maybe it was included as some kind of a bundle and, you know, you had it and, and, you know, you, you didn't, if you didn't use it, well, you know, you didn't really pay for it or, you know, or anything like that, but, you know, it just makes it more important than ever to be tracking. Well, what am I actually subscribed to? You know, do I need all of these licenses? You know, we had a guest on the show a couple of weeks back that, you know, looked at, things like, you know, do we even need this type of license of like a named user license versus can we have, you know, floating yeah. users and, you know, all that kind of stuff where the more you understand, the better, you know, deal you're going to get um, in terms of pricing. But, you know, unfortunately, the less you understand, you look at something and say, oh, 200 bucks a user over here, it seems like a, a, a decent deal. But, you know, if everybody's pricing based on different criteria, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. And that's where you end up with, you know, kind of this subcategory of vendors and partners that you work with that their entire world is to understand Microsoft's licensing. That's it. That's all they do. So they come in and they help you with that or Salesforce licensing or Azure pricing models. 
you know, the, these companies exist and that's their entire existence is based on helping you pick what you need and get it at the best cost. And, and finding those partners and being willing to work with them is a huge tool that I think is really underutilized. Too many people go out to the big name, you know, three letter companies that they go out and buy their licenses from them without ever taking that deep dive into is this what we need? And there's great partnerships out there that can really help at the end of the day, save masses of massive amounts of money for very small costs up front with them. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, it opens, you know, kind of the door to another question that I want to ask around, you know, finding those, you know, how do you find um, those types of vendors and partners that, you know, actually have your best interests in mind? And, you know, it's not just a matter of, oh, hey, you need to buy this and that and that. And, and you know, now maybe you didn't need it, but, you know, uh, you didn't know that you didn't need it. So you ended up, you know, kind of bit carrying an expense that, you know, that you're really shouldn't have. Yeah, for me and finding partners, it really comes down to kind of a three prong approach. And this is something that I've spoken to kind of in the past. Uh, first off, it's going to be referrals. You know, if I get somebody that I know and I trust says, hey, this company is doing really good work. Hey, I know this person at this company. Boom, they're in. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to see what their offerings are. Uh, the second one is, you know, if I ever run across people in person and you know, face to face, yeah, we're doing this. We've got all the video. We've got all the Zoom. Face-to-face -face is still just such a huge and undervalued resource in terms of being able to sit across the table from somebody at a happy hour, at a lunch and learn, at a conference, and talk about, hey, I'm having this problem. And they're like, hey, we solved that problem. Let's go talk a little bit more in depth about this. Uh, third, you know, and if you spend more than 10 seconds in the IT person's chair, doesn't matter where you're available, whether it's on email, phone, LinkedIn, who boy. Uh, you're going to get just avalanched. And one of the things I've really started talking at length about right now is there's a massive disconnect between the sales process and the marketing process and getting in front of IT leaders, looking, looking at myself, but it could actually easily go beyond just the IT realm of how do those folks with these great ideas, with these great products, with these great services get them in front of a very saturated and fatigued market. And we're having those discussions, you know, and I'm learning as much as I'm trying to put out there because I'm kind of opening the door and, and you know, willing to put myself, you know, in the line of fire to say, guys, this isn't going to work for me. Like, I understand this is a technique that you're using, but it's just, it's not going to work. That I am also seeing helps extend like internally with conversations. You know, if I'm sitting across from somebody in the sales team internally that's needing help from IT, somebody in the finance department that's wanting to understand how it's working, opening up and being more transparent about, hey, I, I get it, but that's not going to work from our chair and here's why it won't, it is becoming kind of a mantra of mine of, okay, we need to be all talking about this a lot more. That's a bit of a meandering response to that, but it definitely, it's just, it's so saturated that getting above that noise can be really difficult. Yeah, no. And, and, and that's exactly why, you know, I have people like you on, on the show because, you know, it's, we want to share knowledge. We want to make sure, you know, make the community better. And, you know, part of that is on the customer side, going and being able to root out the things that are Hey, this is just a sales pitch or, you know, this is, you know, a tactic somebody's using to they're telling you to put dashboards in because that's the word of the day over here and not what you actually need, you know, but then also on the vendor side, there's also a lot of, you know, hey, hey there's a lot of pushiness and stuff that's happening because it's there are a lot of customers that are just saying, yeah, I'm interested when they're really not interested. And, you know, you go and, and you go through a years long sales cycle and, and nothing's ever purchased because, you know, the right expectations weren't set up. And I know that was uh, uh, one of the, you know, the posts that you put out on LinkedIn there, just in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we get trust, uh, you know, back on both sides in terms of, um, you know, vendors, but also, you know, on the customer side of, you know, improving that transparency both ways. Yeah, it seems like there's almost a fear, especially on, on my side of that, of, just being honest and saying, hey, I don't have dollars right now, but I need to understand what your product and service is. So if you'll take that time and you're willing to play a little bit of that longer game with me, 
there's a really good potential that somewhere down the road, either I'm going to need the product or service, or I'm going to, here's that buzzword, refer you to somebody who needs that product or service. Yeah, because, you know, what what you see is, um, you know, I, I guess what's, you know, with all this technology, it's made it easier, but I feel like it's gotten people to lose patience in the process where, you know, uh, back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, having building trusted relationships between, you know, vendors and customers was, you know, seen as something great. And if somebody says, hey, I'm, you know, I'm just looking, you say, all right, well, is there anything, any questions I can answer for you? Can I connect you to people that'll get you what you need? Now it's along the lines of, well, at the push of a button, I can send an email out to 50,000 people and 10 of those people might, you know, respond to them and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking to buy something like that. So, you know, you come to the vendor and say, hey, I, I don't have money, but I want to understand your product. And they're like, well, you know, I can just go and send out another 10,000 email blast and somebody will be interested and I can, you know, spend my time there. And, you know, I, I think that, it just shows you, you know, that the value of building the relationship, you know, yeah, it might not turn into a sale today, but, you know, as a community, we need to get better about, you know, let's, there's some things that, you know, we need to go back to. And that's the, like, you know, how do we actually care about the customer and solve their problems and not, you know, meet my sales quota of, you know, 10 licenses over here, but, you know, I don't know what impact that, 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 that my product had on anybody. And I don't even know how my product works. I just know that I can throw out enough buzzwords and somebody's going to say I'm buying it. And and, and that relationship building and that communication, like that's going to serve then across every relationship, whether that's uh, customer sales, whether that's internal within departments in a company, whether that's referral, All of that is built on relationships and the speed at which we can do some things right now has definitely trying to not sound too old over here has definitely pulled away from that and taken some of of the heart and some of the relationship and, and some of that trust and transparency out of it. And it's become purely how fast can I make this a transactional relationship? Yeah. And, and even just from a, you know, the, you know, you can go find product, videos and stuff out there, you know, at the, in five seconds, just search, you know, YouTube now, Google, all, all the different resources that you have. And it's, you know, almost turned into the, the, there, there isn't that relationship in there of like, tell me about the problem you have. Let's talk a little right. bit about it. What, what things have you tried? What are you looking to do? What are your goal? There, there's that piece of it that, isn't there where, you know, if you are on the vendor side of things, you know, there's opportunity for more than just, you know, how do I sell my product? It's, you know, how do I create a customer uh, or a relationship for life that's, you know, more than just, I'll solve your problem today with this. And then, you know, tomorrow I'll call you and say, hey, can we up your user licenses by five more people or whatever to hit my quota for tomorrow? And, you know, those types of things. Great example of that is I was actually I was looking for a, a particular service to help with with a problem I was incurring, and I had one of the really large names in that industry come to me, and you know, they typically service the, the Fortune 500 level companies. And uh, I said initially, I'm like, hey, you know, I know you guys, I know you've got a great product, but you're probably going to be way outside of our scale. Uh, this person, the salesperson, uh, took a little bit of time over the next couple of weeks, and we just bounced messages back and forth occasionally. Uh, they took the time to kind of understand what I was looking for and where I was going. They then said, hey, did you know that we can actually do this at a smaller scale, at a smaller cost to do exactly what you're looking for right now? You probably aren't aware of this based on the conversations that we've been having. Had that person just written me off and moved on to the, you know, their next 10,000 email blast, never would have happened. We've now got a conversation going and the potential is there for me to bring in this really large vendor that six months ago I wouldn't have considered. Yeah, no, that that's a great point. Um, you know, with, with all these different technologies, you know, kind of emerging and, you know, we've, we've now got AI as uh, everyone now has an AI product that, that they want to sell and, you know, AI capabilities, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, how do you stay up you know, in and current in terms of 
what technologies are out there. I know some of the things you mentioned before were like conferences, um, talking to people, having those conversations, you know, building that trusted platform. But, you know, what, um, you know, what are you kind of doing to make sure that you stay, you know, stay up on, on, it's it's incredibly difficult because of the the pace of this is just it's going to keep increasing you know and you know if you thought it was bad ten years ago and you couldn't keep up well you know get ready because it's just going to explode um, for me personally uh, I'm reading all the time like I, I just I have to be out there I have to be reading about what's going on uh, very wide breadth not a lot of depth uh, it's just from what I'm doing, because I'm not specializing in a particular area. You know, I'm leading an IT group that has everything that it's got to worry about. So really focused on touching on as many technologies, as many players in the market, as many ideas as I can, and then going in and picking out those few that I want to get a little bit deeper into. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the AI that we have going on. Yeah, I've said now, you know, for most of my career, most of the shifts that we've had have been uh, kind of ev evolution where it's been, okay, we're going to go from on-premise to virtualized. We're going to go from virtualized to cloud and cloud to SaaS. Each one of those has been a very logical next step from the predecessor before it. Uh, this, these large language models, which will ultimately lead to these you know, true AI models, this is a massive revolutionary step. This is going to put us years ahead of where anybody thought we were going to be right now. If you were looking at just the traditional line, this is going to shake up everything that we're doing. And, and don't kid yourself to think that it won't. This is going to touch every part of our lives in some way or another. It's going to change how we work. It's going to change how we interact with our technology. It's going to change everything. And all of us, not just the people in the IT chair who are trying to predict how this is going to work within our businesses, We've all got to be involved. We all have to be in the know and we've all got to be learning about this because it is that critical to everything that we're going to be trying to do for the next 20, 50, 100 years. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's a great point. So, you know, it, it sounds like and you know, correct me if, if I'm wrong over here, but it sounds like your goal is how do I, you know, know enough about the technologies out there to see if this is something that can help the business. It's not necessarily about, you know, how do I know everything I can and, you know, all the products out there and this and that. It, it's a, you know, what what are these technologies doing and how do they improve the business? Then from there, it's it's a matter of, you know, if someone approaches you with, hey, we have an initiative where, you know, we want to bring AI into, you know, our, our supply chain group or whatever, then it's, okay, let's talk to some vendors out there. And now it's more along the lines of, how do I learn more to know, you know, is this a product that is going to have the features that are going to support us? Um, you know, that's the point where you start to say, let's get a little bit deeper and, you know, really understand what, you know, what our options are. What, what I tell folks that my goal is I want to understand something well enough that I can ask good questions. Because if I can ask good questions, then I can ultimately get to, to good answers. There's, there's too much information. There's too much coming out for me to be able to know those answers. But if I know enough to be able to ask really good questions, I can eventually get to the answers that I need, my business needs, whatever else may be out there. Right. And and past just the surface level, why do I need this? And, you know, it's right. going to make you money. Okay, great. We'll buy it. Right. Versus, you know, uh, exactly. what let, problem? Let, let's get into those hows and let's you know, get that six, seven steps into it, but understand how to, how to phrase those questions as we're getting into each one of those whys. Yeah. And, and I think that just kind of makes it more important than ever to make sure that, you know, number one, you're partnered inside of your organization. And, you know, that means that, having that good working relationship with IT because chances are there are technologies out there. They know a lot more about it than you do, right? Even, even if it's a tiny bit more in terms of what it does, even if they don't know more about what it does than you know, they know about technology in general. And, you know, what are some of those questions to ask to get to the answers versus, you know, you might say, Hey, look, I, I played on chat GPT for, for three hours this weekend. So now I'm a chat GPT expert and, and we should bring it into the organization. Then you start talking to it and, you know, it says, all right, well, 
um, are we passing our our data into this uh, this model? Is this model yeah. using that data to you know to train uh, itself? Is that data exposed to other things? You know, you might say, oh hey, cool, I had it right. This amazing macro for me, and it, you know, it, it saved me all this time. You know, but understanding that you know there's more to it than just the what does it do and what problem it solves that that you need to be thinking about. And those are the questions that you have to know how to ask. Yeah, and 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 you have to be comfortable being able to talk to another group, and 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 it's not a matter of IT saying no, you can't use Chat GPT. So then you say, oh, IT doesn't want us to advance in the age of AI and all of that. It's a matter of understanding, well, you know, it's not a can I do this yes or no, binary yes or no answer to it. It's a, you know, what makes you say that? What are the considerate, you know, what are the things you're worried about versus, you know, what what should I be worried about that maybe I'm I'm not, you know, and, and just going in and entering all this information. Um, and it's about working, you know, back to our earlier point of, you know, how do we work together effectively in order to get to, you know, a common end goal, which is improving the business in some way, shape or form. Yeah, two, two of my most hated comments that I have to make, but they are critical early in these processes are what if and it depends. Because whenever you're first starting down any one of these paths, the first questions that we're going to get asked are always going to be, well, it depends. What are we looking to do? What are we trying to do? What are we wanting to accomplish? Or, okay, yes, we can do that. But what if this happens? What if that happens? And again, really I hate having to bring those to the conversations, but you have to, like, they're just things that have to be brought. They have to be discussed and then you have to work through. Right. It, it, exactly. And it's more than just a, you know, so, sometimes it's made out like the what ifs is, you know, what if it it's raining on a Thursday night on the third of the month, or, you know, and it's like, you know, something where it's super specific and, you know, what's the probability of it happening. But there are a lot of what if questions of realistic events and, right. you know, and, and <laughs> rationale that say, OK, well, we can't just take this particular risk or that that particular risk. You know, I, I always. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, like, I hate when I get the answer, it depends, right? And it's not getting the answer, it depends um, necessarily. It's when I get the answer, it depends in a silo. When I say, should I do this? It depends. All right, well, it depends on what, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. And that those follow-ups have to be there. They have to be there. If somebody just gives you an it depends, they're trying to get rid of you. <laughs> and and getting that it depends right it doesn't it doesn't get either of us anywhere closer to anything better off versus if you say all right should i do this all right it depends you know i'll give you the answer if it depends but i'm going to tell you what it depends on so that way you know you understand that you know i'm not just saying it depends because i don't know the answer to it or i want to get rid of you i'm saying it depends but telling you the factors so that you understand all right, am I, you know, more or less in the ballpark if, you know, this particular parameter changes? So, um, you know, I guess, you know, we talked a little bit about AI and, you know, some of um, some of the great advantages that that it's going to to bring. Like what aspect of AI, you know, I guess, are you most excited about, you know, in terms of like bringing it into the business? One of the most immediate applications I'm seeing is how easy it is making implementation of automation. Uh, before, you know, automation has been around for a while. You've heard terms robotic process automation and different variants of that. Great concept, really great way to help with efficiency, to help get rid of manual or repetitive tasks. But it always took like this really in-depth knowledge of all of the processes, all of the interfaces, and then some sort of scripting, coding, app. Something had to be there as part of it. These these models now are making access to that automation so much faster because you're able to say, I have this, this, and this. Here's a process. Tell me how I can automate this process. And you get to an endpoint where instead of months worth of work, maybe you're handing something off to a small team for a week worth of work to get it done. That's where I'm seeing right now immediately an impact is an automation. Uh, and then the other one, even though this isn't something that I, I don't play in this pool, at least nowhere near on the deep end, uh, it's data and analytics. Being able to just pick all this data out in front of something and say, okay, make sense of this for me. 
the ability of these models to find patterns and to find correlation that humans can't is a huge, huge tool that I think we're just beginning to really scratch the surface on. Yeah, no, that's great because even, you know, even for me, like, you know, I work with multiple clients at, you know, at a given time and, you know, some of them will be on Windows in infrastructure, some of them will be on Linux in infrastructure, and maybe I wrote a script that I can deploy in somebody's environment, but unfortunately I wrote it on Windows and, and you know, Linux is different. Being able to say, hey, look, I have code here. Can you go and, and translate this for me and have it do yeah. it in 10 seconds versus me have, oh, it, it's been six months since I've touched Linux. So let me, you know, look online to see what the syntax for an if statement on here versus an if statement on there and, you know, exactly. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's the the way that it's made, the, the ease of access to that is, is simply incredible. Uh, I'm not quite on the bandwagon to say that these models are going to get rid of developers. I, I don't think we're anywhere near that yet, but you're starting to hear people talking about it and it's going to change development and product and how all of that works together because it is going to make a lot of this faster. And again, it's going to automate a lot of these tasks. So it's going to change it. But again, I'm not going to bang the drum of saying that engineering and development is dead, at least not yet. Right. In many ways, it's great because, you know, having a machine going and writing your code, you know, it's going to be consistent. You know that you can have 20 different you know, these robots generating code for you and, and it's all going to come out in similar format. It's, you know, going to be commented. It's going to, you know, have all the bits and pieces that, you know, that you want it to have. You know, that being said, at least in right now, it requires a lot of checking and a lot of checking by people who know how to do, you know, the underlying pieces where you may not get perfect code coming out of there. You know, maybe it's hard coded to look at, you know, a particular data set. And now you tried to put it on another data set and it doesn't work. And, you know, having someone that understands how do we make this dynamic so it works for anything, you know, is is going to be very important. And it's just going to shift a lot of the focus from, you know, maybe I'm not writing as much code as I was, but I'm doing a lot more checking of the code that the AI is doing. And learning how then to, to deploy and use that code in multiple different ways. You know, they were going to see a big piece of that as well. So it's... It's a, it's a lot of fun to watch what's going on, but uh, again, it's also critical that we understand it. You know, I, I had no idea how close we really are to a true general artificial intelligence that can come up with the ideas. Uh, but right now, you know, we still own the idea creation and then how we use it. Uh, it right now, the, these language models and, and these AI tools that we have, they're the tools that help us get to that point. Yeah. And, you know, I'm seeing that, you know, a lot of like small little utilities here and there, it's, it's amazing for, you know, what you were talking about before data an analysis there. Like I can take two files and say, here's a source, here's a target. Tell me what mappings I applied to get from my source to the target and it'll do it. Right. And, and you could say, write the SQL code, you know, to go and move the data from this table to that table and do those transformations and it'll do it. Right. But, you know, there's a lot of it that's, you know, I have to know what I'm doing to know, how to, you know, prompt it in, in, in many ways. Um, also, the other thing, too, is it's, you know, more important than ever to make sure that your data is clean and in a, in a spot where it can go and properly do this kind of analysis because, you know, you have garbage data going in, you know, you could have the best AI in the world and there are a lot of things it can make up for, but, you know, it's not necessarily going to, um, you know, go and, and solve all your all your problems right away. You got it. Now the, the the ability to discern what is valid data versus just the data that it's been given, I think we're still a pretty good ways away from that being a true uh, accomplishment for us. Yeah, and and being able to understand how is it using this data because you can go and throw some data and say find some patterns in here. But right now, all it's doing is, you know, looking at a pattern and, and just because, you know, for, you know, six months, the, the third Thursday of the month, this particular, you know, baseball player, uh, you know, pitched better than other others doesn't necessarily mean that that's a pattern that, you know, now we need to act on where, you know, make sure we're, we're putting him in on the, the third Thursday of every month, even if he's on two days rest, right? You know, it's, uh, 
you know, understanding really how, you know, how these models are working, making sure that it's not just a black box of, you know, the AI told me to do, to take this action. So I'm taking this action because it told me to take it. Well, is it making that decision based on, you know, the right inputs? You know, we, I saw, um, I talked about this in a previous episode, but, um, you know, we, I worked with a banking client and, you know, they started doing AI and machine learning and, you know, they, they built a model where, you know, the AI was, uh, determining whether or not, you know, they should process somebody's mortgage. Right. And, and, uh, you know, the AI figured out that people from a certain zip code, uh, were more likely to default than people from other zip codes. So it started just denying everybody's requests coming from that zip code. You know, it turns out that people that lived in that zip code were predominantly of a certain type of race versus others. And, you know, now the AI was discriminating based on, you know, based on race, um, you know, and they, they got in a lot of trouble for, you know, for, for doing something, you know, for, for that, even though they didn't particularly know that, that that was the rationale for, you know, why it was denying mortgages out there. And that is a fantastic example of why we've got to be so careful with getting these tools into our professional environments. You know, you, you think about that, you have to understand what data was it trained on, where might those biases exist. Um, and I think you know, we're all very well uh, aware of the public blunder that Google had with their new image creation AI here just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I won't rehash it, but Clearly, that was a model that was not ready. And if we see models like that that aren't ready put into environments where it could very well be affecting somebody's life, we need to get a lot better about how we're training this and how we're checking it before we get to those points, at least from this person's opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's a great point because, you know, right now, every there's this huge race to whether or not it's good, it's not good, whatever, to be able to market the fact that you've got AI in your in your application. Like, you know, you, you could have a dashboarding application and the AI right now could be click a button and it'll generate a title for the for the dashboard for you. It could be like the stupidest thing, but being able to say, oh, we're AI, you know, AI embedded into into there, you know, becomes the selling point and the marketing slogan for, you know, for it. You know, but to your point, there's a lot of stuff that we need to understand in terms of, well, okay, you've got AI, but what are you using to generate the AI? What, to your points, what was it trained on? What biases might it have? You know, is this something that's, you know, going to help us just because you say, hey, look, we're using, you know, an AI to close your books for you and we could do it in 30 seconds. That's great. But am I going to get the right, <laughs> the right numbers in the end when you, when you do this in 30 seconds? Not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but it's really interesting to see, you know, everybody talks about it only takes a certain amount of time for science fiction to become science. And, you know, you think about like you can directly talk about, you know, Asimov's three rules, you know, and how these very well-intentioned guidelines were put out there and they lead to the downfall of humanity because they weren't thought through and uh, done correctly. Uh, and hopefully we, we can learn from science fiction and science and prevent some of those things from happening. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're, you know, having talks with vendors, you know, hey, we have AI embedded in our, you know, our applications and get this, that, that, you know, this has AI and, you know, it's going to uh, improve your, your business and your process. Like what, what are the types of um, questions you're asking? What are the kinds of things that, you know, you're kind of making sure of before, you know, kind of having more detailed discussions with them in terms of, you know, whether or not this is right for the for the business. So, of course, we're going to discuss the security models that they have around. How is the data gathered? How is the data used? How is it going to be, you know, my data and not get anywhere else? That's the same concern that you would have with any vendor, no matter what's doing the calculations and the computations behind the scenes. Um, we've already touched on it as well. Like, what was this trained on? How was this model built? And how are we ensuring that we're not seeing bias introduced? How are we ensuring that we're not seeing uh, increased hallucinations in the responses that we're getting from it? You have to understand those foundationally. And then after that, it's just, where are you wanting this to go? You know, you say you've got AI, cool, we can generate this automated response or we can do this automated correlation. 
but what's really the long-term use of this going to be? Like, how is it going to play with all of our applications? How is this going to ultimately be a part of our business processes as opposed to just a really cool tool that we can say we have? No, that's, that's great. You know, definitely, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of value and information, you know, packed in there. And, you know, it's, you know, again, this is a reason I was excited about this particular episode is that, you know, you hear a lot of the like, hear the latest buzzwords, I got a lot of value out of, you know, implementing my ERP and this and that. And, you know, sometimes it's done with a, you know, uh, we're buying this product, uh, IT, you guys better be good with it. Um, sometimes, you know, it's it's done with, hey, let's have, you know, the right partnership in place to make sure that we're doing what's right for the organization. Um, you know, but more often than not, the IT side of things is is seen more along the lines of, you know, hey, this is a roadblock to us or a hindrance or, you know, or it, we're not going to be able to get all this value uh, right away because we have to do all this extra analysis. And, you know, and, and, and more often than not, those seemingly, you know, headaches uh, that, you know, that you're asked to, to do and those extra discussions, you know, lead to and, and mean something where, you know, how many, uh, you know, finance professionals are going to think about, you know, well, what's, you know, this LLM that you're using behind the scenes, what's it trained on to, to do the, the analysis. They just think like, oh, hey, the vendor told me we could close your books in, in 30 seconds instead of six days. Like, isn't this the best thing ever? Right. And, you know, the, the, the underlying technology and the underlying security models and, you know, all those things that we talked about, you know, are things that, um, may seem in, insignificant, but, you know, they, they can have massive impact if you're not, you know, paying close attention to it. Right. And, and, and how do we ensure that if we're looking to cut spend, that we're not cutting our way to the point where, you know, now we don't have a budget to try out new tools and to be able to experiment and see, is this going to have a, a positive in, impact to my business or not? This is, you know, many companies that, you know, before cloud became kind of, you know, mainstream, they were, well, should I go to the cloud? Should I not? And, you know, many companies just said, you know what? take out the credit card, let's just build one tiny little small model and see if this is going to, if this is going to be good or bad for us. And, you know, you want to make sure that you're continuing to invest in the infrastructure, you're continuing to kind of look forward and see, hey, these are, you know, these are the next gen, truly next generation tools that we should, you know, really be looking at today. Yep. And, you know, as an IT leader, it, it's my job to make sure that I recognize where that business need is at a point in time, but always be pushing forward and looking forward and trying to see beyond just, you know, the, the hood of the car. You know, you want to see all the way out to where those headlights are shining. And that that's my responsibility from my chair is to be able to understand both of those. Yeah, no, th those are great points. Um, you know, I know we're coming up on on time over here. So uh, I guess before we wrap, are there any other, um, you know, nuggets of information or words of wisdom that you have for, you know, those watching in terms of, you know, technology investments or, you know, just general tips and, and tricks or anything that you have? <laughs> no, uh, seriously, it's, it, we have to talk more. It really is that simple. 
technology leadership and business leadership across all of the different areas, we have to talk more. The less siloed we are and the more we understand each of our areas, the better it's going to be for the business and the better it's going to be for all of the employees that we have working for us. We're going to make a better environment for all of them if we just start with understanding all of our areas and talking to each other more. Yeah, those, those are those are definitely great points, um, you know, and, and for those uh, watching the episode, highly encourage you to, um, you know, like our comment, subscribe to our podcast. Um, you know, we definitely want to bring a lot of, you know, more great people like John on 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 our show over here. Um, and, you know, we, we definitely want to hear from you in terms of, you know, what types of content that you find uh, you find valuable. So I know, John, you're very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I read everything that you post uh, out there. And, you know, for for those watching, you know, the best way to, you know, kind of connect with you, get in touch with you is, is uh, you know, would be LinkedIn or are there other social? Yeah. LinkedIn is going to be the go-to that that's where I'm putting a lot of time and effort into building those relationships and, you know, welcome to have a chat introduction with anybody that wants. That's great. And highly encourage, you know, anybody that, um, you know, has questions or, you know, just wants to network and understand the, you know, technology side of it. You know, I know that you're very open and transparent in terms of, you know, what, what things are, you know, helping businesses, what are, you know, what are great conversation starters, you know, how to foster the right relationships. So, you know, definitely want uh, everyone to, you know, follow you on, on LinkedIn and, you know, check out the the content that you put out there. Appreciate that. And, you know, I'm really working hard to, to bring that kind of open dialogue to a lot of different areas. Uh, and, you know, I'm coming in, I'm starting to chat with different businesses and, you know, getting in front of different events to, to just work on this message. It seems like something that would be very straightforward, but to have somebody, especially from the IT chair, kind of sitting up front and saying, hey, let's talk about this more. Uh, it, it's definitely sparking a lot of really good conversation. And I would love to be part of that for somebody who feels like they need that starter. That's somebody to come in and kind of light that initial fire. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, we, we really appreciate having you on the show and you know, definitely will uh, be talking to you in the future of uh, doing another episode over here. So thank you. Thank for you. Really appreciate all it. your words of wisdom. Thanks for having me.